Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Hey everyone, got a great show for you today. I am talking with Dr. Anna Limke. Dr. Limke is a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine and chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. Not only that, she is a super author. She has written two fascinating books. Uh, the one we're talking about today is Dopamine Nation. It is a wild ride about, well, you can be addicted to pretty much anything. <laughs> anyway, fantastic show today. Dr. Linky is a wealth of knowledge, and I think you're going to find this a pretty neat conversation. So here we go. So Dr. Linky, thank you so much for being on the show. You've written two, uh, what I would call extremely interesting books, uh, Drug Dealer MD and Dopamine Nation. Um so before, but for, for drug dealer MD, it's about like overprescribing opioids and, 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 and the trouble of the relationship between doctors and, and patients and then get them getting addicted to opioids. Um, I guess my question would be is, because that is like the whole nation is pretty much aware of uh, the opioid problem right now. They're even making movies about it. Right. Um, why, why is it so hard for people to... To, to not use opioids once they've started using them? Well, opioids are addictive. So they have positive psychological reinforcing qualities that draw people to want to use them again. Um, but probably more importantly, opioids have a vicious withdrawal syndrome. Um, and many people who end up addicted to opioids have been treated for pain using opioids. And one of the symptoms of opioid withdrawal is actually body pain. So it can be very difficult for people with pain to withdraw from opioids because they already have pain at baseline and then opioid withdrawal for the period of time of withdrawal uh, makes that pain worse. So they're highly addictive, they're psychologically reinforcing, they're very physiologically um, dependent and, and create this dynamic where the withdrawal is so painful that some people say they would rather die than have to go through opioid withdrawal. So oh some gosh. of the maintenance of the drug can be not because it feels good or even relieves pain, but because to go without is, is excruciating. And then, you know, like any addictive substance, um, chronic use over time creates this imbalance in the reward pathway that drives the repeated use even beyond its original intention or even beyond it having any positive benefits. It's just a way to, to avoid the pain of withdrawal. For the people that are taking it for pain when they try to come off of it and it causes pain, is it, is it, does it intensify the pain they were already experiencing it, or is it a whole global uh, systemic pain or is it different? It's both. So they'll have an intensification of their baseline pain problem, and they can even have pain in areas of the body that they didn't have before. As I said, even people without a pain disorder can experience terrible body pain when they are withdrawing from opioids. The key to remember is that the key for people with a baseline pain condition is that the increased pain is only going to last the duration of the withdrawal which is usually no more than about two to four weeks, the, the physical withdrawal. The psychological withdrawal and dependency can go on for many months, but the acute physical withdrawal syndrome that includes this heightened pain um, typically resolves within about two to four weeks. And then that individual is left with their baseline pain. Believe it or not, in, in some cases, uh, people who with chronic pain who take opioids daily actually end up with worse pain because of the opioids. And the reason for that is this neuroadaptation and something that's called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, where the chronic use of opioids causes the, the brain to reset its threshold for experiencing any pain so that that person becomes more sensitive to pain over time. So taking the opioids away slowly can actually improve pain in individuals with chronic pain. And that sounds like eventually you're throwing gas on a fire. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So your work with that book or just that book and, and the work that you do, you've laws have started to change about how 
uh, opioids are prescribed. Yes. Um, so, you know, there's been quite a sea change reverting back to the way that opioids were stewarded prior to the late 1990s when there was this massive paradigm shift in prescribing and opioid prescribing levels are, have started to go, go down um, in some places returning to the pre-1997 um, levels. Guidelines have changed. The CDC issued guidelines in 2016. And again, uh, more recently, newer guidelines that are being currently considered and revised around appropriate medical use of opioids, massively re-messaging the false and misleading messages that were propagated beginning in the late 1990s. So yeah, things are changing. You mentioned a little earlier um, when you were talking about opioids, you said like any addictive substance, but that brings me to your book, Dopamine Nation. Yeah. Um, so, but really we can be addicted to anything. In this day and age, that's true because almost everything has become drugified, right? Our technology has allowed us to make things that are pleasant and reinforcing more pleasant, more reinforcing, more accessible, uh, more bountiful, there's more of it. Um, and even things that previously were not that reinforcing, um, we've managed to make them reinforcing. So it's a, it's a hard time to be a human. I, I gotta tell like, that's a wild book, by the way. Um, yeah. It's fascinating. <laughs> like once I started reading it, I was like, I gotta see where this is going. But, yeah. but yeah, like anything, anything mm -hmm. we can be addicted to. Yeah. Yes, it's true. And you know, it's, <clears throat> It's also because we have more leisure time than ever before uh, in the history of the human race. We have more disposable income, even among the poorest of the poor. Um, we have more access to leisure goods. Um, we have this life that we live in a simulated environment online, which means that it's a very much a disembodied experience. Um, and so everything is happening in our heads. And so I think for all of those reasons and more, um, we've all become vulnerable to the problem of addiction. For, for our modern world with like, so you mentioned the internet, um, are some forms of internet more addicted, addicted than others, like some forms of social media, or is it just really depending on where the person's interests are? It's always going to be a combination of the particular drug of choice of the individual and drug of choice just means what is the, you know, what's the key that opens the lock of a given individual's reward pathway. But it's also true that there are aspects innate to certain digital drugs that make them more addictive. Um, and things like that include the ways that they tap into our visual system with the bright lights, our auditory system with the pleasing sounds, the way that they give the constant reinforcement and rewards, the way that they're enumerated with numbers or rankings, which makes us, you know, which is very reinforcing for our brains. The ways that the, um, the AI or the algorithms learn what we like and then keep suggesting more so that even when we're trying to get away from it, you know, they're teasing us with, but wait, but wait, look at this. The bottomless bowls that, you know, eliminate our ability to ever feel like we're done, like we got to the end. So that constant scrolling. Um, so lots of aspects of it um, that, that, you know, by intention have been engineered to keep us there, to keep us engaged, to make it hard for us to get off. So we're all being taken advantage of. Basically, yeah. I mean, one of the ways that people talk about this is that we're not using a product. We are the product. Um, and as soon as you are the product, you know, you, you watch out. Is it, is it possible, like, and I'm guessing the answer is yes, but like, so like, I like chocolate or I like, uh, I like maybe a glass of red wine at night, but is it possible for some people that, that like say Facebook or, or Twitter could be more addicting than stuff like chocolate or, or, or even or, cannabis or alcohol or cocaine? Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So this is, this is, I think what's so key now <laughs> is that even if you're a person who thought that, you know, she was invulnerable to the problem of addiction um, because traditional drugs like alcohol or cigarettes or pot never did anything for you. You know, um, it turns out now there are all these new drugs that didn't exist before. And the possibility of that being just the right 
drug for your particular brain, the chances of finding your drug of choice have gone way up. And if that's your particular drug, yeah, social media can be as potentially addictive and deadly as, you know, cannabis is to somebody else. So here's a tough question. Say there's a high likelihood that everybody's addicted to something. Um, How do they overcome that? Yeah. So what I recommend is a dopamine fast or a period of abstinence from your drug of choice for long enough to reset reward pathways. And in my experience, that's usually a month. So 30 days of fasting from your drug of choice, whether it's a particular digital drug, like an app or a video game or YouTube um, or Twitter or whatever it is, really deciding and planning that you're going to put that away for an entire month. Why a month? Because a month, again, is about the minimum amount of time it takes to reset dopamine reward pathways. Two weeks, all people are is in withdrawal for those first two weeks. So if you just do two weeks, you never get the benefits of having done the fast. It's true that some people need longer, some people need less long, depending upon how severe the addiction. You know, there are all type types, type, all kinds of variables that will modulate that experience. But it's really important to do that dopamine fast so that we can um, recapture our ability to take joy in other rewards. Because what happens is that that particular drug of choice essentially hijacks our reward cycle so that everything else pales in comparison. Our our focus is narrowed just on our drug of choice. And we're kind of anhedonic or joyless for other things. So the fast tells our body, well, you know, not getting that fire hose of dopamine from the outside, have to start to upregulate our own endogenous production. And then usually by about four weeks, people feel less anxious, less depressed, less craving, sleeping better, able to take more, more joy in things. It's also true that when we're chasing dopamine, we don't see true cause and effect. We really have a period of time away from our drug of choice in order to see how it was impacting us. And I know this because I've had so many patients come in after the you know four week dopamine fast and look back at their use and be shocked. Be like, I can't believe I put that much time, energy, money, uh, you know, emotion into getting, using, and hiding uh, my use. So that's, that can be very re- revelatory. Whether or not your goal is to continue to use that drug in more moderation or whether to continue to abstain, it's just good to have you know, that data and to have that insight and perspective. And then usually what I talk with patients about after the four-week dopamine fast is, okay, what now? You want to continue to abstain or do you want to reintegrate that drug back into your life in more moderation? And most people want to go back to using, but they want to use less. They want to use differently. So we talk about what that will look like. We talk about using self-finding strategies to help us moderate our use so that we're not just relying on willpower, which is not an infinite resource. Um, And, you know, we talk about how can our, how can we align our consumption with our goals and values? Let me say though, as a caveat, that if you're physiologically severely addicted and physically dependent to something like um, alcohol or a benzodiazepine, or even in some cases, opioids, such that you might experience a life-threatening withdrawal, then this is not for you. Likewise, if you'd repeatedly tried to stop on your own and weren't able to, this is not for you. So this is kind of a, the least invasive strategy for people with more mild to moderate cases. So if, 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 if when you're chasing dopamine, you don't always see the cause and effect of everything for the regular person. Like how did, are there ways to know if you're addicted to something like that you may be oblivious? I mean, cause if you're oblivious, you're oblivious, right? Right. So I t- to me, I think actually the dopamine fast itself can be a really nice way to see if you were addicted. Um, I know for me, I got addicted to romance novels. The Kindle was sort of my hypodermic syringe. And I kind of joked that I was addicted, but it wasn't really until I decided to stop for a month and experience the universal symptoms of withdrawal, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, uh, that I went, wow, there was something physiologically uh, happening to me that I hadn't recognized. Um, Oftentimes people will think, well, I'm not addicted to pot. I can stop anytime, but I've had many patients will stop and they'll have this very significant um, kind of withdrawal syndrome that they didn't think was possible. And then that's kind of a revelation. It's like, oh, wow, I really was addicted. But even short of that experiment, the things to look for are uh, what we call the, the four C's, out of control use, compulsive use, cravings, and continued use despite consequences. 
as well as physiologic symptoms uh, like tolerance, needing more and more of the drug over time to get the same effect, or needing more potent forms of the drug over time to get the same effect, or finding that the drug is not working for you like it did before. And then also, you know, this withdrawal and dependence syndrome. That was great information. Oh, good. That was awesome. Uh, for all of you listening, I highly recommend you check out Dopamine Nation. It is, it's fascinating. Um, and it'll, it'll open your eyes and it will make you start wondering, well, what, what, what am I, am I addicted? <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Lemke. This has been great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Take good care. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.